Hey y'all, welcome to episode number six of the Coyote Trapping School podcast. I hope you're enjoyed or you have enjoyed the first five episodes and uh, I appreciate you watching, listening, following along, ever how you're consuming this. So um, if you're having any problems or issues, please let me know at chris at coyotetrappingschool.com. Otherwise, let's get into it and I figured uh, we, today we could cover kind of a, a dovetail off of, off of our lot, last episode, our last topic about the motivation, so to speak, of, of why you want to trap. You know, one option would being the predator control method. The other option being trapping for fur. So whether that's wanting to improve your outdoorsmanship skills or just get into to trapping and have a, an additional kind of wintertime endeavor that you're doing, the... Uh, there, there is the potential and the opportunity to utilize that. I mean, that's that's what drives the the trapping industry. That's what is the trapping industry is producing a product, a natural, renewable, sustainable, organic, if you want to call it, product that can be used um, to to make something that's valuable to people around the world. So, I thought we'd talk about if you're not familiar, what some of the options are for your fur if you get into trapping and you have fur that you want to do something with so far as so if, if you want to do something with it in general obviously if you're trapping you're interested in trapping you want to do something with it to me that's the that's the ultimate and, and taking it all the way from the setting the trap to catching the animal you know really catching the animal just like with everything else catching the animal is just the beginning um, processing that fur and getting it to the point where it's it's saleable to me is kind of the, the ultimate in game so we'll talk to you about several different options for what you can do with that fur and how far you may want to take it and the potential upsides and the pros and cons I guess you could say of what those options are so first off we'll start with some some terminology that uh, you know trappers I guess like really like anybody when you get around them they they'll start throwing around trapping lingo that is unique to to trappers and not everybody else knows what you're talking about so there's a couple of couple of terms that you may hear thrown around or, or discussed when you're talking about selling fur and the, the different uh, grades or types of fur that you may sell not not the grades or types but the so far as the the product and how finished it is so the first is is in the round and that's I, I really don't hear that much I, I saw that a lot when I was reading old fur fishing game articles really you don't hear that much but that's that's on the so selling the hide on the carcass so selling the entire animal so if you have and we'll get into the different kind of fur buyers but if you have a local fur buyer and he's and I mean local as in in your town and so as you're running your trap line you're finishing your trap line if he's willing to buy your animals without you even skinning them you're selling them in the round or you're selling them whole and that has that has some benefits because that's less work you, you know all you're doing is catching the animal you're not having to do anything else with it any else of the put up so that's that's less work that you've got in it that also means that you're going to get a lower price because somebody else has got to put that work in to skin it flesh it stretch it and get it to the finished product from a trapper sense the finished product not tanned but uh fleshed and dried so when we're moving to that so the next the next kind of term that you may hear is green, green hides or green pelts. And that's where the animal is skinned. So you've got a hide, but it hasn't been fleshed or dried. So you've done nothing to it except skin it, wrap it up, put it in the freezer. So that may be another option for local local buyers is, well, we'll get into the different options, the different buyers, but green, you've got a little bit more work into the animal so far as skinning it, but really skinning it is the, some people may argue with me on this, but Skinning is kind of the, the least or the smallest portion of getting that fur to a point in which it's able to get be sold to a, an end user. And then you got what I'll call finished or put up or dried fur. And this is fur that has been skinned, fleshed, so it's had all the fat and, and flesh removed from the, from the hide. And then it's been stretched on a board or hoop and dried and so it's 
to the the average person it looks tanned and I get that I get that question a lot of times when people ask and when they learn I'm a trapper they say oh do you tan them and do you tan your fur and you don't for selling it you don't tan fur uh, for for selling it traditional as articles for selling it to the fur market uh, the end users there, there's a big difference in the tanning processes between like a wall hanger type tan, like you know what I've got here, what I've got hanging here, versus a garment type tan. And when that when that animal gets used for for a product where it's sewn and and things like that. So, but it does you know when it's when it's fleshed and stretched and dried, and particularly with like coyotes, foxes, bobcats that are stretched fur out. They definitely look like they're tanned, but they're not. They're, they are not really preserved in any way other than being dried. So they will keep for a time dried like that as long as you keep moisture and insects and bugs away from them. But they are very susceptible to moisture and bugs getting into them and ruining the hide. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and that's, like I said, that dried, um, put up, fur is the, the the most steps that you can take in in getting that fur ready to market so from there those are the different you know a couple of different options as far as how in depth you want to get into into your fur processing if you will so far as as options for selling there are several options one kind of the starter one that i always start with and you don't see it very often but um well before I get into that, let me let me start by saying that I, you know I kind of started off saying that there is the potential. You know, you're you're looking at selling this fur. The market, the fur market fluctuates dramatically, and there are good years and there are bad years. And we've had some really down years the past several years, uh, and I'll, I'll go through a couple of of not necessarily market reports, but the recent sales of the big auction houses, and and then I'll I'll tell you what I sold in the last auction and just to kind of give you an idea but the fur market varies drastically and because the majority of our fur produced caught by trappers the majority of wild fur from the United States goes overseas that everything is dependent you know we're, we're seeing the stuff with the tariffs right now that's gonna have an impact the the strength of the dollar versus all the other currencies China Japan Japanese uh, Russian China, Korea, um, Italy, Russia are kind of the major areas that fur buyers for, for fur that comes from the U.S. Um, so there's a whole lot of, you, you can't even begin to, it's really tough to try to predict what the fur market is going to do because there are so many things that influence it. Um, but say all that to say, if you're getting into trapping to make money, don't go get a part-time job somewhere get a full-time job somewhere trapping you don't get into trapping to make money now there have been times in the past where there have been fur booms and where people did make a living um, you know people there were long line trappers that state hopped and they would start when the season came in in the north and move south as the season and snow progressed and then they might move back north as a breakup occurred and, and spring beaver and muskrat seasons came back in and there were people that would trap six months out of the year and they'd make enough money to live on. Um, that was back during the 70s and 80s, there was a huge fur boom. But in general, the fur market, there's not many people, I'd venture to say right now that there's nobody making a full-time living off fur. I guarantee you there's nobody making a fur-time living off of fur trapping. I don't care what all the shows on Discovery Channel and the Yukon men and all that say, nobody's making a living off fur right now. You know, the biggest, the big name trappers that you know of, uh, the, the lure makers and all that have been around a while, you know, a lot of them got started. A lot of them were long line trappers during that fur boom era. Um, but now they branched out and they're tra selling trapping supplies. They're selling their own baits and lures. They're doing nuisance work or they're doing damage control. Um, they're producing videos and DVDs and books. Uh, Nobody, the, the, fur, the way the fur market is, and as finicky as the fur market is, you can't rely on it as a source of income, is the best way that I can tell you. Um, there, there will be years when you can make a nice side income trapping, 
keep in mind that during those years there's going to be a lot more competition because and, and it, this is all relative in certain places but typically where trapping is a lot more prevalent um, I would say kind of in the Midwest region maybe years of high fur prices is also years of trappers dusting off traps and, and getting out there and trying to chase the dollar typically what happens with that is there is a it results in an oversupplied fur market and the market crashes or the market comes down drastically so and I'm no I'm no market expert but there are a couple things that influence the wild fur market the major thing that influences the fur market wild fur market is the ranch fur market so wild fur is usually considered a cheaper alternative to ranch fur so when ranch fur and, and it's primarily fox and mink. When ranch fur is in high demand and bringing high prices, you'll typically see wild fur demand and wild fur prices climb. Well, that also, like I said, usually coincides. Typically, there's there's almost a it's almost like a year cycle that you it's it's you've got to be on the front side of it because with the way the sales go. There are several, two of the main big auction houses, and we'll get to selling them in a minute, but North American Fur Auctions and Fur Harvester Auctions. That's where I would say the majority of the fur that's produced in the U.S. and Canada goes through to get to, to its end user. So people watch those auctions and see the prices from those auctions. And so if, they, if people see high prices for a certain species, during those auctions, well, those auctions, there's usually three, maybe four auctions a year. One maybe in December, January, one in February, March, one in May or June, and then maybe another one in July or October or something. Typically, there's about three. Um, so, and your fur has to be in to that auction for the, that particular sale, like two months in advance or a month in advance they has to be in, received usually a month in advance of the sale date. Anyway, it's a it's a there's a significant amount of time that your fur's got to be in there. So by the time everybody starts to see that oh the market's hot, the coon market's hot, I'm gonna I'm gonna start hammering some coons. Well, by the time every the trappers react to that, it may be the next trapping season, and everybody's out there chasing that high coon price well all of a sudden the market gets flooded because every, all the trappers are out there because there were high prices last year and so there's way more coon that hits the market and naturally supply and demand if there's a whole lot more supply they're going to pay less of a price for it so it's it's really you from what i in my opinion you can't really time the fur market because Right, it, by the time the market gets good, there's no way for you to capitalize on it. By the time you capitalize, try to capitalize on it and get fur to the market, the market's going to be flooded and you're going to be out of luck because everybody's thinking the same thing and the price is going down. So that was kind of off my notes, but I guess circling back, there are opportunities to make money trapping. Don't count on it. If you need to make an extra $500 a month or whatever to pay your mortgage. Don't count on getting it from trapping. Do something else. Um, but if you want to pursue something, you want to spend time outside honing your craft and learning um, skills, valuable outdoorsman skills, and you'd like to cover your gas money or you know maybe make a little extra money and buy you a new ATV or side-by-side -side on, a, on a hot year, yeah, there's definitely, I would say, potential to do that if you're willing to put in the work and the time and, and suffer and slug through the, the low years um, to, to catch one of the peak years and, and really um, do decent. So, that out of the way, don't get into trapping to make money. Get into trapping because you love it and let the money be, a, if it comes, then it's an added bonus. If it doesn't, it's not going to cost you anything, right? I mean, the way I tell people is, you know, I, I don't make any money deer hunting. Yeah, I put some meat in the freezer. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of things a lot of things that I do that that don't make any money. So um, trapping at least I have a little bit of potential to cover some of my costs. Way I, way I try to look at it. So circling back to what you can do and, and how you can potentially market your fur if that's what you're looking at. The first option 
is local fur buyers. That's what I was saying earlier. And there's not a lot of local fur buyers around right now because the market's been so depressed. So in times of good fur prices, you'll see more people out trying to buy. And in times of bad fur prices, people aren't trying to buy because the, the money's not there. You know, they're gonna, they got a front money, they're gonna pay really low prices, they're gonna get, trappers are gonna be mad at them because they're, they're paying next to nothing for, for the fur. And of course, everybody that's selling something always thinks their thing is worth more than what somebody's willing to pay usually. You know, that's how it goes. So, um, Typically, if you do have a local buyer in your area, it's going to be a trap and supply dealer. It kind of makes sense. These guys, you know, it's somebody that trappers deal with on a regular basis. They're both dealing with each other. So it makes sense for them to be buying fur as well. Um, and, and, you know, could get to the point that maybe you're interested in swapping, you know, for uh, supplies, swapping your fur for supplies or something like that. And any of the any of the dealers that, that do deal with fur, you know, they're usually pretty, pretty uh, agreeable to do that. The downsides, and I hate to say downsides, but something to consider if you do have a local buyer in your area that you're selling to is, if it's a if it's a, a small local person like a like a trap and supply dealer, typically that's going to be the lowest price out of your options that you're going to get paid for your fur, because local buyers don't typically have a relationship with an end user. They're acting as a middleman and they're they may be either either going to ship it to NAFA or sell it to some other supplier or some other buyer that has access to a larger batch of fur that has access to that is enough to interest a, an end user so typically your your local fur buyer is going to be your lowest price that you're going to get for your fur the upside and it's a it's a it can could be a significant upside is that you can get paid when you drop your fur off. So you take your fur to your local buyer if there's one around, and they're gonna look at your fur, tell you I'll pay you this for this one, this for this one, this for this one. You agree to it, they're gonna stroke you a check, and you got your money then. Um, whereas with some of the other options later on, not always the case. You don't, you're not gonna get your money right away. Another upside is your local buyers are gonna be ones that may be more willing to buy either in the round, like a whole animal, or green skin. So you don't have a lot of time invested in your fur versus selling uh, fleshed and dried furs that you put a lot more time into. So, I mean, trapping takes a lot of time in general, not to mention if you are skinning the animal, fleshing it, stretching it, and you know, if you're catching a lot of animals, you're, you're spending, you got a lot of time in the fur shed working, working fur up too. So um, that's something to, to weigh out is, is your time that's involved in finishing those that fur. Next, next kind of up on the hierarchy is what I call regional fur buyers. And you'll see some of these advertised in some of the trapping magazines like Trapper and Predator Caller and Trapper's Post. The most common one that comes to my mind is Grown Walls, kind of in the Midwest, and they even make some roots into the South and, and on the East Coast. I don't know that they do a whole lot in the West, but there are some buyers in the West that are um, more specific to like bobcats or things, but there's there's not a whole lot of what I would call regional buyers, but um, there are there are you know some in, in different areas. Like I said, they usually advertise in some of the trapping magazines, and you can you can find those. And they 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 will uh, excuse me may not have anybody local in your area, but they may have a, a driver or a, a specific route that they'll run where they'll buy fur on that route where you could go and meet them at a, a location and sell them fur like that. I've never dealt, I've never sold to those buyers, but I think they will take in the round. I don't think they're gonna take, or I, I don't think they'll take whole animals, but I do think that they'll buy green hides. So that could be one potential upside again, is that's less time investment you've got into that hide. And they're gonna pay you when you show up and sell you their fur, or sell them your fur. So cash in hand is always something to consider. And I do think, I, I don't know anything about, you know, these guys' business, Grown Wall's business or anything, but I know that they're buying enough fur that I think they've got connections with end users. So they're not necessarily a middleman. So I think you've got upside to get a little bit more better price than you would with a local fur buyer. So I think that is definitely something to consider and definitely a plus. Next down the line, you've got state auctions. So 
a lot, not a lot, some trappers associations, some state trappers associations will host a fur auction at the end of the season. And if there's, a lot of it depends on how many buyers are around and in your area. So if there's enough buyers around or enough buyers that are willing to travel, you know, it's really kind of a neat deal. I've only ever been to one, it was in Arkansas. Uh, but if there's enough buyers that'll come, you, know, you can get the upside of competition, which is always good for getting the most money out of yours. Uh, your fur, you're gonna get paid on site. So you're gonna get a check before you leave the, the uh, auction. It's going to be a, a fundraiser for your association, which is always good. You know, the association is going to take a commission for for hosting the auction. And it's also kind of neat to see, you know, you may be able to interact with some of the buyers and, and get them offhand to look and, and give you some thoughts on how your how your fur looks if you're if you're drying. And, and that's another thing is I've seen, like I said, I've only been to one, but at some auctions anyway, you can buy, bring whole animals and you can bring green skins as well as stretched and dried. So that's that's a plus. And, and like I said, that's a, it's potentially an opportunity to be able to sit down with somebody that, that buys fur, that deals in fur, and, and get some critiques on if you're putting up your fur, what could I do better? What How could I improve? Because there are things that you can do in your fur put up and your fur handling that can really swing one way or another how much money you're gonna get paid for that fur. So those are that's kind of a wrap up the state auctions. You've got you got upside of competition. You're gonna get paid there. A uh, fundraiser for your state association. So definitely some pluses there. The last the last option there is, and for for selling you know a traditional kind of selling fur route, and what I would consider the best figure out how to word this, the best opportunity to get the highest price is with auction houses. And there are two main auction houses in North America that I know of is, is Fur Harvesters Auction and North American Fur Auction. So you'll hear NAFA and FHA. NAFA is North American Fur Auctions and FHA is Fur Harvesters Auction. Both of those are in Canada. And one of the, one of the good things about them is that's their business. Their business is selling fur so they put a lot of money into marketing the use of fur and promoting the use of fur and, and wild fur also. So they don't necessarily sell exclusively wild fur. They also sell, and a big part of their business is selling ranch fur, but they do spend a lot of money and, and travel to some of the, the fashion shows and the fur shows overseas and promote the use of fur and the use of wild fur as a, a natural, renewable, sustainable product. So that is one upside that really, that I know of none of these others offer so much is you know, somebody that's out promoting the use of fur and, and has a, a big budget that's, that's targeting that. So that's definitely something that we need as, a, as, a, as trappers. We need everybody promoting the use of fur. They do have local representatives. So both of these, both of those auction houses are in Canada, but they both have uh, representatives throughout the U.S. that will handle pickup and delivery of your fur from wherever they pick it up to the auction house. Now FHA, and you can go on their website and see the, the their agents. So they have what they call agents, and then you can see the pickup routes, or you can contact the agent to to find out what what the pickup route is. But um, they do have agents. FHA does not have anybody in the southeast. So I think they've got a fellow in Arkansas, but they don't have anybody really in the southeast, which that's where I'm at. I'm in Georgia. And, you know, there's a good many of, of y'all that are looking at watching and listening that may be in the southeast. So that's definitely something to consider. NAFA does have reps throughout the south, and they do make circuits and pickup routes through most of the states in the south i think there's even one that goes down to florida so that's a plus for for us uh, us southern guys one of the caveats is you've got you because they're in canada you're going to get hit with shipping fees so you can ship direct to one of their locations so they've got a depot in in the US so you don't have to ship internationally you don't have to ship across the border but you you can ship if you don't want to deal with trying to make it to a pickup route you can ship directly to one of the depots and then they'll handle getting it into 
into Canada and to the actual auction house. Or, like I said, if you meet the rep, your local or your state rep, and get them your fur, then they'll handle they'll handle getting it to the auction house. But when your fur gets there and goes through the sale, you are going to get hit with a shipping charge. It's not going to be bad, but depending on how much fur, I mean, it's it's fairly reasonable. But that is something that you are going to it is going to cost you extra. Like I say, the one upside is generally that's your best opportunity to get a higher price because you have end users, the, the furriers from China and Italy and Korea and Russia and you know all of the all of the people that are using and making fur garments, they're coming to these sales. So there's no middleman. You are paying a commission for to the uh, to the auction house, but otherwise there's no middleman. So you've got the best opportunity to get the most money out of your fur and your fur gets batched into lots your fur gets graded and batched into lots with you know maybe a hundred other pieces of fur that try to match your fur um, that try to that look like and the quality of your particular piece and then your the lots go through and get sold and you get paid for your for your piece as they get sold like I said there are fees certain species they're gonna drum and they're gonna be drumming charges for fur out species there's also CITES charges I don't really know what that is because we put CITES tags on them but there's always CITES charges so um, that's uh, there, there are definitely fees associated with it most people everybody that I know of sends put up fur so they send stretched and dried fur to these these houses they do offer, at least I don't know about FHA, but I think NAFA does offer a fleshing and stretching service if you just want to send them green hides. And I, I think truly it's pretty reasonable on a, a per piece basis, but that means you gotta you gotta handle all that shipping because your local your local rep is only gonna pick up stretched and dried fur because they're gonna have to keep it for a time and while they work on getting it north. So they're not gonna be able to handle any any green fur or anything frozen so that's one it could be an upside but typically unless you're really close and you've got some great idea about getting heavy shipping cheap you're gonna wind up fleshing and drying your your hides to send, send them there which is gonna cost you more time in the first shed so that's one potential downside is well a couple of the main caveats that's the major one for sending that's one for sending to these auction houses is typically you're going to need to flush and stretch it so it needs to be put up the other is you don't know when you're going to get paid so there's they're they're going to have an auction schedule schedule that's published in advance so i think they've already got their auction schedules for 2018 2019 published but so that means that one you've got to wait until the auction before your first sales or you've got to wait till the auction for the potential for your fur to sell then if the auction doesn't think auction house doesn't think that they're getting a high enough price and this is kind of a, a good and a bad because if they don't think they're getting a high enough price they'll withdraw the op, withdraw the lot and no sell it so it's good from the sense that they're not just selling your fur for dirt cheap if they think it's worth more it's bad from the sense that your fur may not sell at all that sale. So there's very really the potential for your fur to go a couple of sales without selling, depending on how the market is. And that's where I get around to if you are counting on your fur money for something, if you need it, you're best off dealing with somebody that you can get cash in hand from. Because if you ship it to these auction houses, you definitely have a better opportunity to get a higher price, but you don't know when you're going to get your check. Could be two weeks after the sale could be a year after the sale depending on how the market is so that's that's definitely a huge thing to consider is when you're gonna get paid you're gonna get paid um, but you never know when if they think that your fur is worth more and so they no sale it for one sale no sale it for another eventually they've got to move inventory because they're steady getting more inventory and if they're not selling things and they're thinking that fur is, the, the fur is worth more but they're steady gaining inventory that doesn't really put them in a good spot so eventually a lot of times what they'll do is a private treaty if they go for a long time and negotiate kind of one-off deals and so you may wind up getting a check out of the blue that you weren't expecting because it wasn't it's not auction time but they did a private treaty and sold some of your fur that way so 
I think I covered earlier that you know how the how the fur market fluctuates and how wild fur is really tied to ranch fur and what ranch fur is doing. Um, if, if ranch fur is high high demand, high price, wild fur is considered a cheaper alternative. Um, so there are some other kind of non-traditional methods or opportunities, I should say, for sale. Before I get to that, I was going to run through. So both auction houses, um, fur harvesters had their last sale in May, the end of May, and NAF actually had one in May, and then they had another one in July. So I was going to run through those prices, and this is 2018, so fur harvesters. These are prices from May of 2018, depending on when you're listening to this. So beaver, so if you if you look at their their reports, they'll list they'll list the species, they'll show how many how many pieces were offered, they'll show the percent sold, which the percent sold is an important thing to look at. They'll show the section, which kind of tells you the grade or the quality of fur. They'll show the average price and then they'll show the top lot price. The top lot price is the highest price that they got paid. So usually the top lot price looks pretty good. The average prices may look different. So and, and I'll I'll kind of focus on southern fur, but um, so that this doesn't drag out too long. But if they the fur harvesters auction in May, they had thirty over thirty thousand beavers offered. They sold darn near a hundred percent of them, and the average. Average eastern beaver was 1431. Average western beaver was 882. Third section, section three, which is generally what our southern fur, what excuse me, what my southern fur winds up grading at is a lot of times it gets graded as a section three, average 945, which is not terrible actually. Um, wild mink, they had 14,000, 14,500 wild mink. They didn't hardly sell any of those. Otters, 4,600 otters, didn't mainly unsold on those. Castor is one, Castor for whatever reason the last few years Castor has been in high demand. A pound of number one Castor brought $72 a pound, um, number two 63 and number three 50. So Castor, if you're trapping beavers you need to be saving a Castor. Whether you're just swapping that out and, and uh, bartering that for trapping supplies or, or selling it, this definitely has value. Muskrat, they had 83,000 muskrat and only sold 39% muskrat though so they've got a lot of muskrat left average was 316 top lot of eight dollars which three three dollars is not it's not great for muskrat but muskrat takes doesn't take a lot of work to put up so that's one upside to muskrats is you can catch them in large numbers and you can put them up pretty easy sable which is uh, Martin they had 32,000 of those which um, the semi heavy which I would assume are the, probably the ones from the U.S. Average thirty-two uh, and a half dollars, and they 42 percent sold. Lynx cat because these uh, these auction houses are Canadian. They call bobcat lynx cat. Don't ask me why, but they had uh, sixty-eight hundred of those offered. They're northern. The, so one thing about bobcats is the western mountain cats make everything look awesome or they they look awesome make everything else look terrible so the average for western cats and it doesn't show the per, the number of cats uh, of western cats that were sold only 45 percent of them were sold it looks like about 45 percent of all the bobcats were sold but the average was 653 dollars now that's pretty outstanding but you can't really trap western high mountain these quality cats you can't trap them in high production numbers They're, they live in rugged country and um, it's the, it, you're not catching a hundred of those cats a season it's just there's a lot of work that goes into that the top lot western cat went for forty one hundred dollars the top lot cat in general which it was one of those big pale bellied westerns I mean they're they're really pretty bobcats um, northerns and Central, Northerns were $32, Central was $46. Um, so the Northerns probably more kind of Southern, what, our, what ours would be. Raccoons, they had 60,000 coons, probably about 60% sold. East, Eastern coons averaged 241. <clears throat> that's, that's terrible, uh, that's terrible. And that's that's I can you 
I'll, I'll tell you what my my prices were as well because it's it was right in line with that. All the all the coon prices were back. Canadian coons four forty one, West heavies ten twenty five, and then uh, North Central is five seventy seven. So coon coon prices are, are down. Red fox six thousand pieces. I hope I'm not dragging this out too long. We'll run through. I'll try to run through it a little bit quicker. Um, Red fox averaged in the the mid teens. 15, 15 bucks. A lot of people think Red Fox is a, is a high dollar item, but it's, it's not really anymore. Coyote, coyotes have been hot this year. Coyotes have been in really high demand, so they had a, a, a they sold a lot of coyotes, and the central central coyotes went for the average forty one ninety. So that's a, that's pretty good. Not what I would consider southern coyotes. I'll, I'll tell you what my coyotes sold for. So that's a, a run through of FHA. I'll run through NAFAS. Real quick, otters, they uh, mainly withdrew their otters. I didn't have any otters that sold. Beavers, section three. Um, so let's see, my stuff went in the July auction too. Beavers, section three, which is what I would consider our beavers, uh, averaged 837, top lot was $12. My beavers, I think my best beavers did not sell, so that's that's one good thing. Good, but uh, I did have four beavers that sold, average 750. Uh, my high was 14, so that's okay. That's okay considering that my better beavers didn't sell, so hopefully I'll get a better price on those. Wild mink, they offered 13,000, and they mainly withdrew those. The, the high, top lot was 16. Again, mink's one of those that a lot of people think that's a top dollar fur, and it's not really so anymore. Muskrat's about the same. Listen to this. There were 260,000 muskrats offered by Napa. It's amazing. And if you look at their, I don't think this has the, the ranch fur numbers, but they sell, in this, this same auction, there were millions of ranch fur uh, articles offered, which, one, shows you how over, um, over, flooded the ranch fur market is which is also part of the reason why um, so as I was saying ranch fur and wild fur kind of track together ranch fur has been there's been I guess everybody all the ranchers thought there was so much more potential or possibility so they steady increased their capacity well now there's an over supply of ranch fur and the market is going down well it's not like ranch fur can just shut off like wild fur. You know, with wild fur, when the market falls out, there's trappers that fall out. And so there's some people that aren't trapping. There's some people that may sit on their fur and try to hold their fur for another year. But ranch ranchers can't do that. They've got to they've got to put a, a certain percentage of their stock up for sale every year. So that's what's that's another whammy that's hurting the fur industry right now is that there's an overabundance of ranch fur on the market and it's, the fur is not really in demand in general anyway, so that's further depressing prices. So, um, that's a boatload of muskrat though. Average $3.15. Red Fox, they didn't hardly sell any of the Red Foxes. Coyotes, this this hits the Eastern. I don't, I don't know how many, how many Southern folks sell to FHA. I don't really know anybody that sends to FHA. Coyotes, like I said, they've been a top dollar item this year. Eastern Coyotes, they average $24.20. Section three, which is usually what mine fall into, uh, 809. So that kind of, and let's see what I had. All of my coyotes sold, averaged 920. It's not great. I mean, that's, that's right on the average of the section three. I had one that sold for 20, um, so not bad. And I had one that sold for four. But Two years ago, I had a couple that sold for less than two dollars. So man, it, that really hurt my feelings. Lynx cat, I don't think I didn't have any cats, bobcats that sold. Um, the only ones mainly that sold on this were in Napa were western cats, and then raccoons. Two hundred seventy-one thousand coons sold uh, for sale. They only sold twenty percent, so they didn't sell many coons, and the average was four dollars and a quarter not real sporty and raccoons was another one that hurt my feelings uh, i sold 17 coons and my average was three dollars and a quarter um, like i said again with the coons it looks like my the coons that did sell were my better quality coons so that gives me a little bit of hope that the next sale i've got my best fur uh, best fur lining up so i had 
I had gray foxes, red foxes, bobcats, otters, coons, beaver, and coyotes. And the only thing that sold was beaver, coyotes, and a handful of coons. So we'll see where that goes. <clears throat> Hopefully the next sale will be a little better. I'm, I know this is dragging out, but uh, stick with me. Just a couple more options for non-traditional ways of selling fur. So there are a couple of other options besides the traditional fur market. Um, one is through taxidermists. So that takes some connection and some reaching out and really beating the bushes on the trapper's perspective. But there are taxidermists that are willing to buy buy specimens. Maybe they may be for competition. Um, you know, a lot most taxiderm associations that I know they do competitions and they're always looking for a, a top quality piece to to mount for the competition to look really good. Then we've all been in Bass Pro and Cabela's that have a zillion amount mounts and there are, you know, there's there's taxidermists that get contracts with Bass Pro and Cabela's if they're building a new one to supply those animals. So that is an ideal scenario is if you can get hooked up with somebody, a taxidermist that's looking for a, a pile of critters and you know you can just sell them directly the fur that you're or the, the animals that you're catching one of the one of the generally your best option for that and, and the I should say you know being able to sell a lot of fur to a specific taxidermist or a lot of animals is not a great option not a great odds but um, one of the one of your better options or scenarios is if you've got kind of oddity so black coyotes typically if you catch a black coyote you can find somebody that's interested in buying that um, and that also plays into the fact that the variation of wild fur is really hurts it in the fur market so you're not going to get the same price typically at a fur auction for a black coyote excuse me, for somebody that's making coats because they want a uniform, they want a bunch of uniform pieces that they can piece together um, in general. So variation in oddities is not great for the fur market, but you can, if you if you can make the right connections, parlay that and get, get an even better price for, for that in a taxidermy market. It may mean you need to freeze it whole, which is going to take up a lot of space in your freezer. It may mean that you have to skin it in a particular way that the taxidermist wants. Um, so that's one thing that you got to judge if you're comfortable enough to be able to get that skin and quality that meets the taxidermist perspective. Another option, our opportunity is a live market. So this is, as with all this stuff, be sure to check your local regulations because different states have different regulations. But um, the live market is, you'll hear, you'll hear people talk about that, but that's selling the fox pens. So that's selling the foxes and coyotes where it's legal to pens several hundreds to thousands acre enclosures where houndsmen come and they run their dogs and they either do training or they'll do competitions and um, that can be a good way you know that's, that's I'm not real sure how 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 prevalent that is anywhere else I know it's it's prevalent in some states across the south and it's pretty popular it does require specialized equipment so you've got to have a catch pole you got to be able to handle those animals you got to make sure that you're minimizing foot damage <clears throat> which is trappers we want to do anyway, but you may have to go uh, an extra step of providing some kind of a penicillin or, or something like that shots to make sure to prevent infection. Um, you got to have a dog box or some way to transport those animals live. And if you don't have somebody that's super local, like right down the street that you could make a catch and take them to that day, you may have to have a holding pen too. So Fox pens is kind of if you can get into that market. So that's one thing is it's not an easy market to get into. Those guys are pretty old school and kind of tight knit, close knit group. So they're not just going to let any outsider in. They're sure not going to pay any outsider a top dollar price. If you are trying to deal with them, they're going to they're going to put the put their thumb on that and try to push that price as low as possible if they can. But it can be an opportunity to get a, a lot more money for that animal than it would than you would be able to get selling it to the fur market. So something to keep in mind, but it is going to require some definitely extra effort on your part in keeping those animals live and in good condition and, and getting them to sell. Another option uh, is to tan the fur and sell it. Now I say that I don't necessarily mean tan it yourself. That's definitely something that you can try if you're interested. But if you're going to try to sell that fur to other people, I strongly recommend, unless you're very familiar with tanning, that you send that fur to get tanned. It's, I, and I've, I say that having tried to tan fur myself. If you're not set up right, you're not going to get the soft quality fur that other people are expecting. So um, 
if you're if you're gonna do that I recommend that you send that fur off and get it tanned by somebody that knows what they're doing a tannery there you have though that you're sending out that much more money you've got a huge more a lot more investment now of sending that fur off to get it tanned then get it back and then try to sell it and selling it's not as easy as and, and I'm, I'm one that, that uh, and I, I say it from experience selling that fur is not always as easy as you might think it is um, so that's definitely something to have in mind is how you're gonna market your fur once you get it tanned and get it back because you're gonna have a significant investment in it and with um, some of the tanneries there's Moyle Minkin Tannery there's USA Fox um, there, there are several others and that, that kind of do a, a trappers or a wall hangers tan and I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, they got they do have quantity discounts. So if you ship them one to ten animals, you're going to pay one price. And, and this is all the same species. If you ship them one to ten coyotes, you may pay twenty six bucks. If you ship them ten to 50, ten to twenty, you may pay twenty four bucks. If you send them forty six to sixty, you may pay twenty two bucks. So typically, the more the more pieces you send them, the lower your cost is per piece, but you're still growing your overall cost. So something to keep in mind, it's, it's definitely something that you may want to consider, but have a good marketing strategy of how you're going to try to sell that tan fur because you're going to have a lot invested in it that you're going to try to be getting out of it. Uh, really, that's all the, the options of the, the major parts of fur or, or animals, but there are a couple of other kind of add-ons, what I, what I would consider them. So. Um, when you when you skin the animal and you get the fur, you should sell the fur. You've also got you know you've got that carcass left that you have some you may have some opportunity with. Um, one big one is a meat market. If selling the meat or selling the carcass of that animal is legal where you are, and it's definitely not in all states, unfortunately. But in the South, one thing in certain states you can sell raccoons. A lot of times in the South, the raccoon meat is worth more than the raccoon hide is. So that's definitely something that where you can really supplement and improve the the your return on your track line investment if you can sell that if you can sell that meat it's definitely if it's if it's available there that's definitely something that should be worth looked into of course you know there's there's all there's whole other things that when you're you know cause when you're just skinning it you're just ripping the skin off you're not really concerned about the meat and, and you know how long it's sitting out and things like that so you know you got to keep in mind when you're selling the meat you don't want to leave that animal sitting out all day. You got to get the guts out of it. You got to wash it down. You got to care for it. So keep that in mind when you're sent, when you're you know you're selling that as meat to somebody else. There are markets for skulls. Now these are skulls and bones. So the skulls there there are big um, big buyers out there that they their business is cleaning and selling skulls. Now obviously or I say obviously but. They can't be, you know, bullet hole to the head skulls. So that's one thing that that got to be taken into consideration is, you know, it needs to be either caught in a conner bear or on a drowning wire or something like that. Uh, or if you're predator hunting, you know, you make a you make a shoulder shot, a heart shot instead of a head shot, you may have an opportunity with that skull. And then the the, the price is going to depend on the how easily accessible those animals are. So usually, you know, bobcats and otters bring a higher price than say beavers and coons because there's not as many bobcats and otters trapped as there are beavers and coons so one thing to consider and and bones uh it's not not very prevalent but there are people that do you know make jewelry and different things out of like coon baculums and beaver teeth maybe canines um so that can be an option too if you know somebody that's utilizing those things as you know really we need to be trying to get you're already handling that animal, so if you can get as much use out of it as you can, that's all the better for you. And then lastly, glands. Glands are in certain, most glands, I guess, are in, in pretty high demand by lure makers. And depending on the glands, now granted, it takes a lot of animals to make up enough glands to be able to sell to somebody. So one, you gotta know how to remove and what glands to remove. You gotta make sure you're storing them in a way that you know somebody's gonna wanna buy them. And then you've got to have enough that you get somebody interested in buying them. But like I say, most big trap and supply houses and lure makers are looking, always looking for certain types of glands. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, beaver caster, as I said before, if you're trapping beavers, you need to be saving a caster because that's uh, valuable either selling or trading for, for supplies. 
And then skunk essence would be another major one that if you can dispatch that skunk without it spraying and you're, you've got enough stomach to remove that essence and extract that essence, that can be pretty high dollar stuff if you're catching a bunch of skunks. So usually trapping supply dealers are looking for that. I've also, uh, I think Tink 69, um, the, you know, the hunting, hunting lure maker, they buy skunk essence. So there's, there's options there. And like I said, all that stuff is just kind of incremental or supplemental, but you're already doing something with that, that carcass or that animal anyway. So you might as well try to get as much out of it as you can. I know this went long. I honestly don't know how long it is. I don't have a clock in here. I need to get one so I can keep track, but I hope it was all good, valuable information. I, uh, I, I tried to kind of pre-plan it and have a little bit of an outline so I wasn't rambling so much, although I, I just still got off on a couple of little tangents, but I tried to keep it, keep it focused and I think it's all good information. So hope it was helpful. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Hope you're enjoying this. Be sure to give us a, a thumbs up or, or uh, five stars in, in iTunes or wherever you're, however you're consuming this. And I uh, look forward to trapping season. Hope you have a good one and you're getting ready because it's coming quick. Hey, I just wanted to say thanks for watching. Thanks for following. Thanks for listening. Ever how you're consuming this. And uh, if you want to show some support, I appreciate your support of just watching, leaving comments, and interacting with me. If you want to show a little support and help support the podcast, the, the YouTube channel, and uh, the, the trapping endeavors and, and us bringing you the content, be sure to go to coyotetrappingschool.com. We've got an online store there. We have some coyote merchandise. So if you need a lucky trapping hat, we got you covered there. If you need a little more luck on the trap line, got some Cody, Cody Trapping School hats, shirts, gloves, bags. Uh, we also carry some Minnesota trap line products, baits, lures, and urines, uh, top quality stuff that I use on my trap line every year, and uh, also sell those in packages. So if you're interested in getting started and you don't really know what baits or lures to use, you can buy one of the packages that we've got, uh, that I've got kind of pre-selected. Um, that that's a good a great starting point to get out there and start catching game also if you're new to trapping and want to learn more about it want a a clear concise and uh, central location to learn how to do it the coyote trapping 101 course that i put together uh, takes you from start to finish uh, from the bottom up so far you know what gear you need how to set a trap um, where to set traps and how to set your traps and even what to do after you catch your animal, your, your coyote, skin it, marketing, marketing your furs and all that. Like I said, all that's in one central location if you're tired of trying to piece together and part together YouTube videos and forum comments and different things. Go to this one central place. Soon we'll be adding uh, different species, raccoon, bobcat, beaver, otter, fox, um, to try to make that a, a well-rounded trapping library, not just specifically coyote trapping, but if you're interested in trapping, that's the place that you can go to and watch the videos that you need when you need them on your time and uh, and learn specifically uh, how to get started trapping. So be sure that's also on the website at Coyote Trapping School. Be sure to check that out and I appreciate y'all following along. I appreciate the support and I hope y'all are killing it on the trap line. Good luck this season.